Today's video is a reflection on the struggles I had when I first started working with the manufactured PCP in my hands. Uh, whether it's testing, debugging, or trying to see what is happening with the circuit, I had a lot of struggles. And at the heart of this struggle is the fact that hardware's iteration cycle is longer than software's iteration cycle. It takes more time and more money to make even a tiny little change in our hardware. Hence, in today's video, I want to share about six additional, totally optional stuff that we can include in our PCB even if the circuit is working perfectly fine so that we can test the PCB, we can make some uh, debugging, have some indicators and many other cool stuff just so that it makes it easy to work with our prototype PCB. The first optional but good to have a feature that I wish I included in my prototype PCB was modularity in the schematic. Whether we want to reuse part of the circuit in the future version of the same project or in other projects. An example of modularity used for different projects can be seen with Adafruit. The first board is a temperature and humidity sensor board with SI7021 and the second board is a light sensor board. If you look at their schematic, we will see that the power supply circuit using the LDO AP2112 on both the schematic. Similarly, the I2C pull-up circuit with the MOSFET BSS138 also uses the same circuit. In the electrical schematic, I usually box up the entire circuit into functional logical blocks with the direction of the power flowing from left to right. This makes it easy to copy the designs to future projects. All right, the next tip for our prototype PCB, once again, very optional, is to include many options for the PCB. And these can be such as do not populate parts, solder jumpers, or use the zero ohm resistors. And I think this is a fun way to expand the functionality of a single PCB. So check out this article as a primer on how to use DNP components in PCBs. It explains in detail how the same PCB can be used for, say, in testing other configurations or separating a load. As a simple example, in KiCad, I have kept an option for this clock line to be either pulled up or down. In this case, I will not populate with the pull-up resistor R13. When soldering, I also keep a note of the DNP components on the silt screen so that I can quickly look out for all of them. Solder jumpers are similarly another great example for adding options. In KiCad, there are a few varieties of uh, schematic symbols for solder jumpers. If we initially want the circuit to be open, we can choose the open solder jumpers. Or if we want them to be closed and cut the circuit, we can choose the bridged solder jumpers. Now, the footprints are even more varied with different types of shapes and sizes. So just match the footprint with the type of solder jumper symbols that you have chosen in the schematic. I like to use the open solder jumpers inside each of my functional logical blocks of the circuit that I have never tested before. That way I can isolate and test them one by one, like in this case for the LiPo charge management circuit, the GPS circuit, or the LoRa circuit. So let's look at a practical example of an open solder jumper in the Arduino Nano 33 BLE board. Now at the bottom layer, there is an open solder jumper that that is connecting or rather not connecting the 5 volt pin to the V USB with the specific instructions that this pin outputs 5 volts. But for it to work, we need to short the V USB jumper on the back of the board. And for an opposite example, for a bridged solder jumper example, let's look at the TINC 4.0 dev board. On the back side of the board, we will see an opposite instruction to cut the solder bridge to separate separate the V in from the V USB. So this article gets into the detail of solder jumper best practices. If we need to open and close the jumpers repeatedly, we should probably not use the solder jumpers, but use a jumper on a pin header. So for example, in the YW robot breadboard power supply, to select the output voltage 3.3 volts or 5 volts, 
we need to move the jumper to the corresponding pins. So lastly, on the topic of options, I will leave you with some thoughts on using zero ohm resistors. It can also be used as a jumper or a configuration circuit. Now the big advantage of using this component as opposed to say solar jumpers is that zero ohm resistors can be automatically populated by a pick and place machine. Hardware debugging. It is just so common to pick up the multimeter and probe into our PCBs and the test points make it very, very easy. So an example of test points can be found on the Raspberry Pi Pico board. There are six of them on the back layer from TP1 to TP6. And sometimes the shape can be slightly different like uh, round ones and they can be used with pogo pins to do board level testing in manufacturing. In my current PCB, I have like so many test points. Okay, I admit that I'm a little paranoid because you know, this is the first time I'm integrating all of these components. So I have 24 test points. <laughs> And in KiCad, there are many schematic symbols for choosing a test point. I have used almost all of the ones with the one passive connection. This coaxial one looks pretty rad, but I've no idea how to use them, but really just choose one of the schematic symbol. As for the associative footprints, there seem to be even more choices based on not just sh the shapes, or, but also sizes. And some of them are also through holes. Well, just choose whichever works for your case. I chose a simple, large enough square shaped pad so that I can probe it with a multimeter. All right, the next important thing is helpers. Once again, very important, but totally extra, totally optional, are the notes on the silk screen layer. Very handy notes will help us zoom into the details faster. So let's look at the Icebreaker FPGA dev board as an example. The first important notes on the silk screen are the component designators. They are sprinkled all around the board, but only in two directions so that they are easy to read. There are also notes on the power such as 5 volts here, 3.3 uh, volts there. And if required, we should also indicate the positive and negative signs for say the battery terminals. Next is a tip from one of the creators of the icebreaker dev board, Peter. He uses these footprints for passives. Now notice there is a polarity indicator for the LEDs and I have referred to his KiCad library to integrate them into my own projects as well. I also use a little dot or a small circle to indicate the first pin of a component. At other times, there can be unclosed lines to indicate the placement of the chip like this FTDI chip on the icebreaker board. And finally, it's good to write the project name, the version, the date so that we can refer to the correct PCB. You can also consider having a tiny writable area on your PCB. Now I have used the silk screen white box to write the address for my radio modules or a unique serial number. Just a permanent marker will do. All right, the next step is all about mounting holes. Now, maybe in the future version of the PCB or um, after the first version of the PCB, we might uh, take the shape according to some mechanical housing, but at least for the first version, the prototype version, we should include mounting holes. The prototype PCBs, which are typically say rectangular in shape, can have these mounting holes in the four corners. Particle IO has plenty of boards with such mounting holes, uh, such as this boron board that has the four mounting holes of 0.1 inch in diameter. The particle IO boards actually actually follow the Adafruit feather specification, which has some great practical things to include in a dev board that is typically 0.9 inch by 2 inch with these 0.1 inch holes at each corner. Now in KiCad, the mounting holes are of course not part of the schematic. So in the PCB layout, we can place
increase a footprint and search for the mounting holes. And there are plenty of options once again. I tend to go with a non-plated through hole M3 sized mounting hole that comes with a courtyard check to make space for say a potential use of a pan head screw or a hex nut. Now be sure to lock these non-schematic footprints so that they remain on the PCB layout even after a new net list is imported. And the last totally optional item to include are LEDs. Yes, LEDs, they visually indicate that parts of the circuit on the PCB are working just at an instant. So I will be referring to the schematics of this Robodyne SAM D21 M0 mini board. Here there is a logical block called the indication unit that has one of the most common LEDs to be used. For example, the power D4 LED connecting the 3.3 volts to the ground. The second most common indicator LEDs will be some kind of TX and RX as shown here. And depending upon your application, you might choose to put in other types of LED indicators. For example, here I am using an LED connected to the PPS pulse per second signal of the GPS component. Or there is also an orange LED here indicating that I am charging the LiPo battery. So a little caution on using many LEDs or even a single LED, especially for a low power project. LEDs consume current. So if we want, uh, we can either desolder these LEDs or maybe put a bridged solder jumper and cut it after confirming that the circuit is fine. So here, once again, you can see the reverse example, an open solder jumper, and you can probably uh, just connect it if you need the LED. Yes, yeah, so those were totally extra and optional things to include in our first version of uh, the prototype PCB or dev boards so that it just makes our life a lot easier in terms of testing, debugging, referring to comments, notes uh, for the PCB. Now, before making this video, I asked on Twitter, what other suggestions do my PCB designer friends have? If you have any other smart hacks to add on to our pro prototype PCBs, please leave a comment below and we can all learn together. For example, Baoshi here has a very clever one using test clips for the ground to keep one hand free. You know, I keep learning so much from all the open source projects out there. And I men mentioned many of uh, my favorite dev boards that I have bought and used. And so thank you to all of the designers and engineers working on these dev boards that I have learned a lot from. And I hope you also go and check out their schematics, buy some boards, and let's continue the learning. And uh, well, I hope you learned something out of this video. I would love to know what are your comments. If you have spotted some mistake, go ahead leave a comment below and thanks for watching see you in the next one